So we're going to dig into chapter 31 of Ezekiel. This uh, oracle was given, uh, let's see, t in terms of the actual time. It's somewhere around 586. It's right before uh, the fall of Jerusalem. Then we're going to get some stuff about that, that uh, oracles after the fall of Jerusalem. Yeah, this fifth oracle took place uh, uh, just a few months before Jerusalem fell uh, to Babylon. So let's pick up. And there's there's a lot here, but I think there's a lot of repetition as well. Chapter 31, verse 1. In the eleventh year, in the third month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, Whom are you like in your greatness? Now, uh, what we're going to see here is a very clear and discreet inclusio. Uh, you go, if you just slide ahead to verse 18 at the end of this chapter, you'll see the question is asked again. Whom are you thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? We'll get into the significance of that, significance of that image of trees of, image, uh, of Eden in a moment. But uh, the significance here is we have an inclusio or an inclusion. You remember an inclusio or inclusion is a block of scripture that begins with a word or a concept or an idea and ends with that same concept or idea. And uh, it signals that everything in between is really about what that um, those, those inclusion version, verses are getting at. And what's being gotten at here is that Egypt was especially blessed by God, number one. And number two, that uh, no matter how we may think we have achieved things, nothing that we have achieved is possible without God's empowerment that ultimately while the devil still uh, wreaks havoc and reigns over the sinful flesh of humanity, God is ultimately in control. And the problem with Egypt, as we've seen with all of these nations and with Judah, uh, against whom God has given these oracles, is pride, the pride of self-worship of idolatry um, in the service to the self. And that is the problem, uh, that is the core problem of the human race. And in all of these oracles, what we see is both a remembrance, I'll get to that in a minute, and a foretelling. The remembrance is that in Eden, humanity fell because of human self-centeredness, the desire to be like God. So every cataclysmic or judgmental event, every time God has wrought judgment on nations and peoples and even individuals, the judgment has come because of our self-centeredness, our turning away from God, and ultimately, even if uh, uh, idols are involved, the worship of self. So there's a remembrance. But there's also a foretelling. And that is that pride does go before a fall. And the whole human race, the whole cosmos will be judged for self-worship. But in the midst of that judgment, God still issues a call for repentance. And all who have entrusted themselves uh, 
to God, um, whatever their sins may have been, and whatever their sins are, they will belong to God in his restoration, if you will, his resurrection of bringing about of a new Eden. And so uh, this chapter is shot through with uh, remembrance of e uh, Eden, but Eden as a uh, proto-event, a uh, first event, uh, a kind of preview of what is going to happen with the whole human race. And seeing it specifically through the prism of Egypt, God's call to Egypt to repent and believe, and God's judgment on Egypt. And we're seeing here that God is not treating Egypt or any of the nations any differently than he treats Judah. He wants all, since he's the creation of all, to turn to him and live. But when we do not turn to him, when nations and peoples do not turn, individuals do not turn to the God we now know in Jesus, they are left vulnerable and uh, defenseless uh, before the wrath that exists outside of the grace and provision of God. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So, whom are you? Who, whom are you like in your greatness? In other words, it, it, who, who's as great as you are today, Egypt? Now, what God is going to do is use Assyria. Assyria was considered one a, a, a great empire and uh, virtually um, invulnerable, and yet. Assyria fell, and Assyria becomes a lesson to Egypt and every other nation uh, who take pride, and people who take pride in their own uh, accomplishments, or what they perceive to be their own accomplishments. So we'll read on. Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon. Assyria was actually in the area that we uh, basically geographically today of Iraq. But the cedar of Lebanon, of course, you see that used throughout scripture uh, as being a, a strong, um, um, perseverant and beautiful tree. So the analogy of tree here is very important and think already in the back of your mind the trees in Eden. Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shade and of towering height, its top among the clouds. The waters nourished it. Remember, Assyria, where Iraq is today, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers run, um, considered to be maybe the cradle of civilization. And uh, those two rivers are among the first four rivers mentioned in Genesis. This is a very important place. And in fact, many of the rabbis thought that Eden was there. Now, others would say, no, it was on Mount Zion, but you get the point. It was a favored place. The waters nourished it. The deep made it grow tall making its rivers flow around the place of its planting, sending forth its streams to all the trees of the field. So you get the idea of Assyria being an important core place um, whose prosperity and power and influence spread and other nations like those who were dependent on Babylon or Egypt or others um, in their turn, uh, they grew as a result of it. Client states, maybe we might say. So it towered high above all the trees of the field. The trees then here are nations and peoples. Its boughs grew large and its branches long from abundant water in its shoots. So we're, we're to read this both um, 
literally and figuratively. You know, the water of the Tigris and Euphrates, but also the power of Assyria. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field gave birth to their young. Under its, and under its shadow lived all great nations. So Assyria was one of the uh, great powers, um, you know, you, worthy of being listed with the Roman Empire and the Macedonian or Greek Empire and, um, and, and the Babylonian and so on and so forth. But it was almost a prototype of these empires. Verse 7, it was beautiful in its greatness, in the length of its branches, for its roots went down to abundant waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not rival it. Okay, now you're, you're seeing what uh, God is saying, that there is an almost Edenic, even Edenic quality to Assyria. It is so favored. It is so strong. It is so beautiful. It is so respected and revered and feared. It, it, it has overwhelming influence over the nations around it. And it's a place of such beauty that has been so favored by God that uh, not even the trees in Eden could rival this, this cedar of Lebanon, okay? This uh, mighty towering tree. So you're getting the idea. The, and, and let's be clear. When nations rise to preeminent power, when people rise to preeminent power, it is because of the talents God has given them, the opportunities God has given to them, and so on and so forth. The brawn, the brain, all the rest, it all comes from God. The temptation in that kind of preeminent success is to think that we, our nation, ourselves, are the reason the ultimate reason for our success and there is of course is a finitude to success in this world because the fall has already taken place and from the fall comes decay death and so our call is to turn to the one who makes us and the one who makes our lives possible. Success is a very difficult thing to handle. Um, impossible without God. All right, that's a really and think of all of the petty little things in which we can take pride, and we can become arrogant. And every time that happens, it reflects precisely even in a fleeting thought, it reflects precisely our fallen nature which we inherited from Adam and Eve because they couldn't handle the perfection that God had created for them. They allowed themselves to be lured into sin and then pass that sin on to subsequent generations. The call is to repent and believe. Uh, verse 6, uh, excuse me, 9. I made it, that is the cedar of Lebanon, I made Assyria beautiful in the mass of its branches. And if it wasn't explicit enough for you, look what he says in the second part of, chapter, of verse 9. And all the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. Well, now there's a very interesting phrase. All the trees of Eden envied it. Now, this is hyperbolic language, obviously, but this would incorporate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, right? They, they 
if you'll forgive the pun, all the trees of the world of Eden pine to be like the cedar of Lebanon in its perfection. This is what how God blessed Assyria. Now you can see the setup that's going on here. God is drawing an analogy between Assyria, whose fall was unthinkable, to Egypt, who also thinks, and whose Pharaoh thinks, that cannot fall. Verse 10. Now we're out of the poetic portion of the oracle. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it towered high and set its top among the clouds and its heart was proud of its height, I will give it into the hand of a mighty one of the nations. In other words, I'm going to cause another nation to overwhelm it, destroy it, which is what happened, Babylon. Uh, he shall surely deal with, its, with it as its wickedness deserves. I have cast it out. Expelled, cast out in the Greek in the New Testament is ekbalo, which means thrown out, which we translate as excommunicate. All right, they're going to be excommunicated from the provision of God, but this is always done as excommunication is meant to be done in the church as a means of calling people back into fellowship with Christ and his church to repent for um, unrepentant sin. Verse 12, foreigners, the most ruthless of nations, have cut it down and left it on the mountains and in all the valleys its branches have fallen and its boughs have been broken in all the ravines of the land and all the peoples of the earth have gone away from its shadow and left it. All right, so that this is the total fall of Assyria that God is talking about as a way of warning the people of Egypt and calling them to repentance and faith because they suffer from the same arrogance. Verse 13, on its fallen trunk dwell all the birds of the heavens and on its branches are all the beasts of the field. Now, once earlier in the chapter, we see that the birds are nesting in its branches, taking um, sucre from uh, its uh, shade and so on. The beasts of the field are there and they're lapping up the opportunity to graze and to drink from the waters close to the, the tree. But now this tree is gone and their lives just go on, right? Uh, the mighty fall and the world goes on. Verse 14, all this is in order that no trees by the waters may grow to towering height or set their tops among the clouds and that no trees that drink water may reach up to them in height for they are all given over to death to the world below among the children of man and with, with those who go down to the pit. Now we're talking about what has happened to Assyria. Assyria, this mighty tree, has fallen, and now it's in the place of the dead, Sheol. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a memory in this world. It no longer is. Now, this resonates, of course, uh, of the story of the Tower of Babel. And we alluded to that earlier when we were talking about chapter 28, dealing with, um, I think it... Uh, it dealt with uh, <coughs> the Philistines. And so uh, you're seeing a pattern. Uh, pride goes before a fall. And also not to think this world is the end all and be all. There is a, another world. There is an eternal world. And we are accountable to the God who has dominion over this world and the next. Verse 15. Thus says the Lord God, on the day the cedar went down to Sheol, I caused mourning. I closed the deep over it and restrained its rivers. 
and many waters were stopped. I clothed Lebanon in gloom for it, and all the trees of the field fainted because of it. It was such a cataclysmic thing to see this once powerful nation on whom some nations depended for their prosperity. But the, the thinking is, well, wait a minute. If their power didn't protect them from destruction, then who can be protected from destruction if this world and its successes are what provide us with security? And Assyria, of all the nations and peoples, was not protected and was not secure. Then what about us? And there's always a dimension of that in our grief, right? Um, it's not just that uh, I grieve over the loss of this person, but also that person reminds me of my mortality. Uh, when our parents died and my aunts and others were dying from the previous generation, and I would say, we're next up. You know, in the normal course of things, I mean, no, no one can say when they may die, but we do know that the death of previous generations and then of people of our own generation reminds me, reminds us of our finitude and our mortality and that this world is, if, 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 if we're counting on just this world, right, as Paul puts it, if for this world only we put our hope in Christ, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Because this world will not be our permanent home. So now, uh, Assyria has gone to the place of the dead, of shame. Uh, verse, <clears throat> let's see. Um, verse 8. Yeah, 16. Okay, I found this on the web. Uh, or has gone to the place of the death of shale. Uh, Check it out. My, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it out loud. My S-I-R-I has just tried to communicate with me about shale. So there's a little interesting tidbit for you in, in our session tonight. Verse 16. I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall when I cast it down to shale with those who go down to the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all the drink water were comforted in the world below. Uh, there was a comfort uh, that came to those in Sheol, knowing that even the mighty Assyria fell as well, that they weren't the only ones. Verse 17, they also went down to Sheol with it, to those who were slain by the sword. Yes, those who were its arm. Who lived under its shadow among the nations. So even the, the dead who had been conquered by Assyria looked at the fall of Assyria and uh, took some consolation and comfort from that. Verse 18. Whom are you thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? You shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the world below. You shall lie among the uncircumcised with those who are slain by the sword. So what Yahweh is saying through Ezekiel is this is going to happen to you now, Egypt. The same thing that happened to Assyria. By the way, I figured out why S-I-R-I -I responded. is because I've been saying Assyria. Um, verse, um, at the end of verse 18. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, declares the Lord God. So, this is what's going to happen to you, Egypt. Now, in chapter uh, 32, we're going to see a bit more of the implications of 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 this um, uh, uh, in other words a bit more of the meaning of shale and the place of the dead so in chapter 31 we saw 
uh, three clear segments. Verses 2 to 9 dealt with the, just talking about the cosmic tree of this nation of Assyria. Then verses 10 to 14 talked about the tree's destruction because of its pride. And uh, verses rather. And then verses 15 to 18 uh, told us that the tree was felled by God through the uh, instrumentality, uh, the means of Babylon and descended into Sheol, the nation condemned for its pride and arrogance and its self-worship. Now, the last of the oracles against Egypt uh, comes up in chapter 32, and this was given by God in March of 585 B.C., and so this has happened after the fall of Jerusalem. Oh, I'm beeping again. I don't know if you can hear that. Lots of little things in, in tonight's study. Sixteen little beeps. Anyway, this is uh, uh, March of 585. Jerusalem fell in the summer of 586. And... Uh, so this would have happened um, at the end of winter, this oracle, in 585 B.C. There are two oracles here. The first one goes from, and this is very uh, easy to see, it goes from verses 1 to 16, and it was delivered two weeks before the second one, which comes at verses 17 to 32. They are both basically kind of uh, uh, rehearsals or, or elaborations of the earlier oracles. Uh, the first concerns the fall of Pharaoh. It's like chapter 29, verses 1 to 16. The second one is uh, a bit about the descent into Sheol. And here we're going to see information there's not a lot of information in scripture about hell uh, and there'll be uh, this this is one of the more elaborate descriptions of it that we're going to see and then the chapter is going to end uh, verses 13 to 14 um, with a, I would describe it as a me, uh, an indirect messianic prophecy it's foretelling in the midst of this judgment and sorrow uh, that it is still God's will to bring life from death and uh, to bring salvation to the world, which we know comes to us in Christ. Chapter 32, verse 1. In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, remember the uh, Hebrew year starts in April, so March is the last of the twelve months of the year. So in the twelfth month... Uh, in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. This is a very familiar formula to us in Ezekiel by now. Son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him. Now, <laughs> uh, lamentations were, um, there was a formal um, Hebrew poetic form for expressing sorrow over death uh, and, you know, over the loss of someone. And what's happening here is God is going to express sorrow over the fall of Egypt, but there's also going to be gloating here at the presumption of uh, Egypt and particularly of the Pharaoh um, and the people went along with it. Um, and we must never forget that the Bible believes in collective guilt and collective sorrow, as well as collective repentance and collective faith. The church is a collection of individual peoples who together have life with God. I mentioned on Sunday that when uh, Jesus uses the term uh, kingdom of heaven, in the Gospel of Matthew. He's talking about the church uh, on earth 
and in heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven, the people of God who trust Jesus uh, uh, on earth and in heaven. But the idea here is that if we put up or, or uh, with the presumption and proud and arrogance either of our church, our family, our, fam uh, our, our, our nation states, without holding up the call to repentance and faith in Christ, we bear uh, the collective guilt and shame of the nation of which we are a part of the communities of which we are a part. And so our call is to constantly uh, crucify people with the word of the law and raise them again with the word of the gospel. So here we go. The Lamentation, verse 2. You consider yourself a lion of the nations, but you are like a dragon in the seas. Now, the term here... Uh, is probably best uh, translated as crocodile or serpent sea creature. I've talked a little bit about that. So you're not all that, is what God is saying. This is the lamentation. You burst forth in your rivers, trouble the waters with your feet, and foul their rivers. So uh, you are a filthy monster. You're not that big a monster because God is bigger than you, but this is what you manage to do. You manage to desecrate and despoil and make impure the blessings that God has given to you. This is the indictment. Verse 3, Thus says the Lord God, I will throw my net over you with a host of many peoples, and they will haul you up in my dragnet. So what's going on here? God is saying, through the agency of these nations and peoples that I choose to use to uh, bring you uh, judgment, I am going to haul you in, you old dirty, filthy, no good crocodile, and uh, you will be in my net. You will be, uh, uh, you will face judgment. Verse Four, and I will cast you on the ground, on the open field I will fling you, and will cause all the birds of the heavens to settle on you, and I will gorge the beasts of the whole earth with you. Now that echoes what we saw about the indifferent way in which the birds and the beasts still uh, nestled and existed around the fallen tree of Assyria. Now we're being told that Egypt is going to fall, and everyone is going to have you for lunch, Egypt. This is a lamentation. Verse 5, I will strew your flesh upon the mountains and fill the valleys with your carcass. I will drench the land, even to the mountains, with your flowing blood, and the ravines will be full of you. The destruction will be complete. When I blot you out, I will cover the heavens and make their stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give its light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you, and put darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Judgment. Uh, the Judgment it has been declared by God. Now here's the deal. They've been warned. They've been, uh, they've had messages from God before. Um, and nothing has worked. Uh, just think about the plagues uh, in, in Exodus. Verse 9, I will trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries that you have not known. So here you have uh, an echo of what the experience of Assyria was or the experience of surrounding peoples uh, around Assyria was after Assyria fell. Verse 10, I will make many peoples appalled at you, and the hair of their kings shall bristle with horror because of you when I brandish my sword before them. 
Now, what God is saying is they, these other peoples will recognize that they are as weak and as vulnerable as Egypt, which seemed to be such a powerful people. And this is a, spoken not just to Egypt, but to the Pharaoh who, who said, I am a lion among the nations. And uh, I, I cannot help in reading this of thinking about Vladimir Putin who uh, is just a, a dictatorial thug, a despot. And um, I was looking at a, a CNN um, documentary on him, and uh, it, uh, portions of it they'd already used, but this was in light of what was going on in Ukraine and so forth, and also in light of his fearful response uh, to Prigozhin and the Wagner group for uh, uh, confronting him. Um, but one of the things that it talks about uh, is that um, after Muammar Gaddafi uh, fell in Libya and then was found and brutally murdered by a uh, uh, you know, a, a people who had suffered much at his hands, that's not to, uh, uh, that's not in any way to uh, justify the way, uh, quote, justice, uh, human justice, revenge, was meted out by uh, the people against Gaddafi, who was a monster and a murderer. Uh, but apparently Putin has looked at that video over and over and over again and has commented to um, lieutenants, aides, that can you imagine this happened to him? Uh, he, he's horrified by it. And he vowed that that was not going to happen. And so he's become more repressive and more murderous and more paranoid and more uh, 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 of, a, of a thug uh, in a, a futile attempt to protect himself. One of the things I've been praying throughout this horrible invasion of Ukraine is that Putin would both be brought to justice, true justice, not the justice that was meted out against Gaddafi, which is false justice, um, but also come to repentance. Uh, but pride is a very hard thing to repent from. Uh, Bill says an artist could have a feast with all this imagery. Absolutely. I, I sometimes wish I had the ability to do that. But so often when people try to create art out of the imagery in oracles like this, it's kind of cartoony and, and, and literal in the wrong sense of that term. So it would require someone, a real artist. Verse 9, now we go from the poetry of the lamentation into a more direct speech. I will trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries that you have not known. I will make many peoples appalled at you, and the hair of their kings shall bristle with horror because of you when I brandish my sword before them. They shall tremble every moment, every one for his own life on the day of your downfall. If this can happen to Egypt, it can happen to us. Verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. I will cause your multitude to fall by the swords of mighty ones, all of them most ruthless of nations. And they're not going to take any prisoners, in other words. And back to a poetic expression. They shall bring to ruin the pride of Egypt, and all its multitude shall perish. I will destroy all its beasts from beside many waters, and no foot of man shall trouble them any more, nor shall the hoofs of beasts trouble them. 
Then I will make their waters clear, right? The waters, oh boy. You know what? I've got to stop right there because I need to speak at some, um, in some length about verses 13 and 14 uh, before we get through the rest of this chapter, which goes on and you know till chapter uh, verse 32 so i'm going to stop right there we'll pick up in uh, at verse 13 uh tomorrow night of chapter 32 because uh there's a lot to be said here in verses 13 to 14 which is uh i call it an indirect messianic prophecy so you can just let that simmer tonight and then we'll get into the good stuff tomorrow and we'll probably uh, get started on into chapter 33 then so um, let's uh, end our time together with prayer tonight father you are gracious and loving and steadfast and you are abounding in steadfast love, and you're slow to anger. You call us to turn from sin and death and pride, and the burden of, of self-dependence, and you free us to draw life from you, the only life giver. And you call us to live in your forgiveness and grace and to know that Jesus Christ God the Son has redeemed us bought us out of our condemnation and imprisonment to sin self and darkness and has given us new life that begins now in our baptism and will uh, culminate in your perfect kingdom as we trust in the God who comes to us in baptism. Uh, we pray, God, that you would give each of us a peaceful night of sleep and that we will uh, wake up tomorrow morning refreshed in your grace and goodness and empowered to live for you. We pray for our world that you would bring an end uh, to the war in Ukraine and that you would uh, teach us uh, to turn to you in humility and faith. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. And I will plan on seeing you here tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern, as we continue this uh, uh, study. God bless.